Welcome to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, the founder and president of Creation Training Initiative, where our goal and our mission is to train other people how to speak and teach on biblical creation and apologetics so that they, in turn, can go out and start training our next generation. Well, today's topic is about something called apologetics. And with me today on a return visit is Dr. Anthony Silvestro from Ohio. Welcome back, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Now, we had a great session last time, and I think it was a great encourager and something to give a lot of people confidence. How to share the gospel at your office. And we found out they can legally do that, can't they? Absolutely. But there's some cautions there, aren't there? They have to do it, but not interfere with their work. That's right. So if you missed that show, you need to go back and watch that. How to share the gospel at your office and do it legally. Well, today's topic is apologetics. I have to ask you, what does that mean? Does it mean we're supposed to apologize? Absolutely not. Well, what kind of a word is apologetics in? It's to give a reason defense. Reason defense. So it doesn't mean apologetics. It means we have answers. Now, wait a minute. Does the Bible tell us to do that? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> oh, so the Bible tells us. So it's not just you saying this. It's not just me. Now, the Bible does tell us, and it tells us in multiple places we're supposed to go out there and be ready to have answers and defend what we believe. Is, now, isn't that just for the intellectuals, though, those people that have the high degrees? No, it's for every one of us. The gospel message is a very simple message to understand yes, and to I, preach. Well, the, the verses I like to use are 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. Where it tells us, it's, this is a, not only just telling, this is a mandate for all Christians to bring down all strongholds and everything that exalts himself against the knowledge of God. Then there's another one called 1 Peter 3.15, which tells us we're to have a ready answer, a ready defense for the hope that we have. Then there's a third one, Jude 3, which actually tells us we're to contend for our faith. Now, do you often use those verses when you go out there I, I do. And, and, and I've got to stop you here because, you know, 1 Peter 3.15 is, is one that I think is often misquoted by Christians. You know, oftentimes we, we say 1 Peter 3.15 is always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And yet there's something missing, isn't there? Yes, the first part. The first part's missing, right? Explain we, that one to me. It's the first part of this that we always leave out is, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. So we, the central core to apologetics is that we're supposed to sanctify the Lord. We're supposed to have him front and center in our apologetic. And in what, what does that mean? It means when, when we look at the presuppositions of what we're supposed to do when we give apologetics or give our apologetic, Jesus Christ is front and center his word is true. The Bible is true. It's 100% true. It's an inerrant. And we have to know that within our deepest core when we're given the apologetic. Okay, two things here. The sanctify, uh, putting the Lord first. That means we need to set ourselves apart. And that's, isn't that what sanctify means? To be set apart. Not be like the world, but be set apart from it. We're in it, but we don't need to be like them. That's right. So I thank you for bringing that up. That is an often missed piece there sanctify, be set apart. And I wonder how many Christians out there are setting yourself apart, being bold enough to actually be able to give the gospel and have enough knowledge to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ when it's attacked. So that's, uh, thank you for bringing that up, sanctify them. And that means we set God first. And then the second part you brought up, I think dealt with our starting point, our presupposition which really brings us into something called our worldview, because that's how we build our worldview over those things we pre-assume to be true. That's an easier way to put it sometimes. Yep. We have pre-assumed certain things to be true. Could you give us an example of some things as Christians we must pre-assume to be true? Well, the Lord's real. Yes, he's, he, God is real. He does exist. He's real. And that not only does he exist, but Jesus Christ came here died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried, resurrected again three days later, according to the scriptures. That's real. And so that has to be one of the presuppositions we have. We also have to have the presupposition that 
the Bible is true, it's his word, and that anything else outside of the Bible is not. If it doesn't agree with the Bible, it can't be true. That's right. So our basic starting point, let me summarize, see if I can summarize these in two, two pieces here. Number one, God does exist. He's the only true God. And secondly, his word is true from the very first verse to the very last verse. Because if he's God, he can preserve his word. Yep. So if we don't start with those two, we don't have a Christian worldview at all. Not at all. And that way we're not sanctified, are we? We're in the world, like the world, but not set apart. That's the importance. Thank you again for bringing up that part of 1 Peter 3.15. It is very important to understand that especially in our evangelism and our worldview, were to be set apart. That's right. Now, when we talk about apologetics, there's, there's different ways of doing this. There's different parts of apologetics. Some people use evidence only. Uh, and that can be good, but it's not going to save anybody, is it? No, it's not. And so what's interesting about this is that I did it that way for years. And uh, I can say today it's wrong. I did evidential apologetics only. And... And it wasn't with the idea, even though I sanctified Lord God in my heart, the apologetic didn't do that. And so, you know, when we talk about evidential apologetics, what is it? You know, most often we reference Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel with all the evidences. And um, what I find when I'm evangelizing, whether it's in my office or on my street or with family members, that when you throw evidences at somebody, they don't stick, do they? A lot of times they don't because they, we all have the same evidence, don't we? They just view the evidence different than we do. In other words, the evidence is, is one thing, but the evidence doesn't say anything. It's how we interpret the evidence, and we interpret it based on our worldview. That's right. So if we have the wrong starting point in our presuppositions that make up that worldview, we're going to look at, interpret, or if we don't have an answer, we're going to come up with a rescuing device, which I know you've talked a lot about. So there you, you brought in again the presuppositions, how we build our worldview makes a big difference on our view of the evidence. And unfortunately, a lot of people out there calling themselves Christians, and they may well be Christians, don't have a complete worldview and they interpreted the evidence according to man's wisdom. And the big case of this is time. How old is the earth? And a lot of our Christian leaders out there do not start with God's word is true. They may believe God exists, but they don't believe his word is true from beginning to end because they don't believe that God created everything in six days as his word clearly states. That's right. So we've, they have a different presupposition than a complete biblical presupposition or starting point there. So we've got evidence, and it, there's nothing wrong with the evidence, but if that is all you ever use, you're going to miss the gospel, aren't you? You are. In other words, let, let me see if I can glean something from here, here, from, from your brain up there, your three pounds. What we're saying is the main reason we're doing apologetics is evangelism. That's that, right. That's what you're getting at is evangelism. It's not just to win an argument, is it? Not at all. And that's the one thing I caution people when I teach presuppositional apologetics, because it's a powerful apologetic method, as we're going to get into in the next couple of minutes. But all it's meant to do is to get us to the gospel, to show people the law, show that they're in a sinful state. And that's that scripture we used, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 bring down all strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So then we can go for what I call the juggler. Give them the gospel. That's right. <laughs> because it's not our words or our fancy wisdom that saves anybody, is it? It's not. It's the word of God that will have the saving power in there to them. Let the Holy Spirit, don't ever get into the idea that we can change anybody's life because we can't do that. We can give the information, but it's the Holy Spirit that's actually going to change their lives. And uh, that's what happened to me. And, and you, you gave your testimony a little bit on, on the last video. And if you haven't seen that, you need to see that again because it deals with how to share the gospel in your office. And then there, Dr. Sylvester gave his testimony. And it wasn't because anybody witnessed to you. The Holy Spirit got a hold of you. That's right. What I find really interesting with evidences as well, and I, I don't want to overlook this fact, is that let's say I'm evangelizing somebody and, and just giving a bunch of evidences. If I'm not the most brilliant person they're ever going to encounter, they're going to encounter somebody else who knows more evidences than I do. Yes. And here, here's the statement Mike. get. Well, at least we've showed them the evidence doesn't always support evolution, so we got them halfway there. 
you know, halfway there, still halfway, it's all the way to hell, isn't it? That's right. And oftentimes that person is going to call out their buddy to refute you, find a way to refute you, or they're going up on the internet and they're going to start researching online until they figure out a way right. to refute you. Yes. They're and protecting that worldview. That's right. Because that, that's the key. If we can show their worldview is not consistent with reality, then we put a major hole in their whole idea of thinking. Because all their evidence, how they understand the evidence, is based on their worldview, which comes back to their pre-assumptions. That's right. There's a really interesting analogy out there that I've heard, and uh, Saiten Bruggenke uses this in his, uh, in his apologetic. Imagine that you are building a wall, a brick wall, and you're laying brick by brick by brick. And, and before you know it, you're 30 feet high and you're on top of your brick wall. What happens if somebody comes to you and says, that first brick you laid wasn't perfectly straight. And now your entire wall is built up and it's not perfectly straight. Think about that person. The last thing they want to do is come off that wall, come off their presuppositions, come off their worldview. And so part of our apologetic not only has to be to show that the worldview is wrong, but doing it in gentleness and respect and giving them something to land on softly, which is the gospel. Great. Now, how would, uh, let's talk about, uh, I want before we talk about resources, let's get into more of these pre-assumptions pre in here, the presuppositional apologetics. We talk about we have evidence. We can talk about foundations of their evidence, but we talk about critical thinking skills. We can talk about biblical apologetics, what I call practical apologetics. Who did Cain marry? How could the first three days be real days without the sun? And could Noah really fit all those creatures in the ark? Those are great apologetics, which give you confidence in the Bible. Absolutely. But presuppositional pre apologetics gets down to the very core of why you believe what you're believing. And uh, you have any examples there? I, I, I typically use one of these, and it's dealing with this question. Probably one of the main questions why people will not accept Jesus Christ. How can you call God good when he allows evil to exist? That's right. And now we don't have time to answer that one on this session. But that is a major issue, and every Christian should be trained how to answer that question. Unfortunately, we have a lot of leaders in our church who can't answer it. No. It's a presuppositional question that comes down to what do you believe is the difference between good and evil? That's right. And that gets you right to what they're really believing. And I love it when that comes up in a topic, because we have where the Bible is the only book in the world that has the answer to that question. No other book in the world has an answer to that question. Only the Bible does. That's what we mean by getting to presuppositional apologetics, answering those core value questions. Who is your God? What is he like? Now, what are some of the questions you like to come up with on presuppositional apologetics? Does that ever come up in your dental practice? All the time. I mean, one of the biggest questions you get asked, well, I should say the two biggest questions you get asked is, do you really believe Jesus to be the only way? And the other one is, well, why do children get cancer? Or why do bad things happen to good people? Right. So, you know, when you lump that together, it's always about a good and evil. That's right. And that gets you right into the presuppositional apology. They're really, it's hard to answer those by evidence. You really can't come up with a good answer by evidence. That's right. But you have to go by what do they really believe is good? and what they really believe is evil. Do they really believe evil exists? There's some people out there who won't admit to that. Some don't. They, they really won't. Until you make it personal to them. And then you see the inconsistency in their thinking. When it becomes personal to them, they immediately change their whole worldview. Yep. Yeah, you know, that works really well for people who believe that heaven and hell are not, well, at least hell is not a real place. And so when you talk to them about being a lawbreaker against God, and then you pull that over into a personal aspect and say, well, what happens if your wife was killed? They change their worldview real quickly, don't they? Yep. Very different answer yes. at that point. And that gets into the whole idea of what we call moral relativism. That's true for you, but not for me. That's a self-contradicting statement. It cannot be defended. That's it's right. inconsistent. And that has permeated our society, this postmodern culture that we have. They teach that in many of our public school systems today. There's no real right or wrong. I actually had a college student come to me one time. He said, Mike, my professor told me in my class, college class, math class, there are no absolutes. What, in a math class? 
<laughs> well, that means you can put anything down for your answer. But what's really funny is think about the statement, there are no absolutes. What did that person just say? They gave an absolute, didn't they? They did. And mm -hmm. the, the sad thing is a lot of our students don't know how to answer that, or if they do, the professors get angry. So the professors are showing their inconsistency in their own worldview right there. This is the power of presuppositional apologetics, showing the other person's worldview, what they're basing all their thinking on is not consistent with reality. So I love to use this when I get into discussions. It's the most powerful tool you can have because it really causes people to walk away and start thinking because they can't look on the internet to, and save themselves by evidence. They look at all the evidence, fossil record, DNA, genetics, uh, dating methods, it's not going to solve their answer, solve their problem there. How can you call God good when he allows evil to continue? Well, what's your definition between good and evil? I'd like to have a universal definition. You know the atheists can't do that? No, they can't. They really can't. They, they try to. Of, they try to, but none of their answers are consistent. None of them are a universal answer. They all depend on personal opinion or what one society may believe, but other societies might believe something different. So it's not a universal definition at all. Basically, yep. it comes down to who's ever in power makes the decisions. And when the power people in power change, we can have all different decisions. That's right. That's why we need a universal standard, and that's where God comes in. His word is true, and he exists. Those are our two foundational pieces. Now, can, do you have any other examples that, that you've used in there? for pre How would you answer somebody when they say, do you really believe Jesus is the only way? Well, the first thing you find out is if they profess Christianity or not. Good for you. See, there's the power of asking questions. Rather than just giving information, you're asking questions to get to the real reason why they made that statement. That's right. So when they're, when they're a professing Christian, the first thing I will do is open up the Bible with them and go through some of these verses and ask them to, to tell me what it means and what it says. And intuitively, they know what it says. And at that point, you're watching a person really with a struggle because they're professing Christianity. They tell you they believe the Bible to be true. And now they're reading these scripture verses that is the complete opposite of what their worldview is, the worldview that they built up in their own minds. Yes. Now, you don't uh, force them when you say, okay, uh, do you believe Jesus is the only way? Well, not really. Do you want Novocaine? <laughs> you don't do things like that. I don't like do that. it like that. No, no okay. <laughs> We don't want to put any pressure on them, do we? <laughs> Not at and all. And we shouldn't. We shouldn't. We do this, again, as we said, with gentleness and respect. Have a lot of tact. Remember, we're in there to be evangelists, and, and it's not us going to change their lives. We can break down some strongholds, but we need to get them to understand the truth. And one of the talks I do is, uh, why do you believe the Bible? That gets down to the presuppositional level, too. Why do you believe the Bible? When I'm asked that question, I don't talk about any other religions. The question is, why do you believe the Bible? And I talk about the Bible. You know where I start? My presupposition is God does exist and His Word is true. Because if we don't start there, why do you believe the Bible? That's right. <laughs> you have no reason for believing it anymore. And that's where a lot of Christians are today. They've compromised with the world. They've brought all these different pieces from these different religions. And that's happening in churches that's being preached from the pulpit a lot too. Mm -hmm. So any other words of wisdom on presuppositional apologetics, uh, what you have there? Yeah, boy, you know, when we talk about worldviews, there's a huge battle in worldviews. And, and so I think this can summarize some of the things we talked about. We look at Matthew 12, 30. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Well, that's a powerful verse. Powerful. I mean, two worldviews. You only have two options here. Can you imagine being against God? And that's what Jesus is saying. If you're not with me, you're getting, he didn't leave any middle ground at all, did he? None. None whatsoever. I mean, you can look at Romans 8, 7 as well. Because the carnal, the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Or James 4, 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship of the world is enmity with God? And that word enmity means hatred, doesn't it? Hatred. Yes. So if we're against God, we, we're actually hating him there. That's right. Yes, we need to, as Christians, make sure in our mind we really believe this statement. God does exist, and His Word is true from beginning to end. And it's not a matter of man's interpretation. It's what did God tell us. 
And there's one thing that, that uh, is really important as a consequence of this, knowing there's only two worldviews. When we talk about a worldview here and here, does that leave room for a neutral ground? No. No neutral Jesus said it. Either you're with me or you're against me. That's no, right. No in between there. That's right. And oftentimes when we are evangelizing to people who are not Christian, whether they're atheist, agnostic, or, or just a different religion altogether, they will ask us to meet them on this supposed yes. neutral ground. Or they'll say, oh, we have our religions, we have a lot of things in common, we're really not that far apart. Well, we're a whole world apart. If they don't believe Jesus Christ is the only way for salvation, it doesn't matter how many things we have in common. We are a universe apart right there. That's right. The, the difference between heaven and hell. That's exactly right. That's an easy way to put it. Difference between heaven and hell. Just because we have a lot of things in common doesn't mean we're the same at all. It comes down to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you really believe what God told us about His Son, Jesus Christ? Yeah. What a wonderful session again. I want to thank you very, very much for being with us. Any other parting words before we sign off here? You know, I, I love the idea of uh, the pretended neutrality fallacy, as Greg Bonson said. and. Uh, the thing you always said, when you, whenever as somebody asks you to be on that neutral ground or come to that neutral ground, he says, they're not, yeah. and that you shouldn't be. It reminds me of one of these bumper stickers. Let's coexist. You know, the first thing I want to tell that person or ask them, how much are you willing to give up so I can coexist with you? In other words, you give up something first, and are you willing to give up a lot so we can coexist? No, see, they don't think of it that way. How much, if you're going to coexist, how much are you willing to give up? Because if you're not willing to give up, then you're not willing to coexist, are you? So I want to thank all of you out there for watching this show again. Again, Dr. Anthony Sylvester, that's your second time, and two powerful messages. Presuppositional apologetics. All Christians need to learn how to do this. It is not just something we are told we should do. It is a mandate. Why? Because our, we have a whole generation growing up today, folks, that don't know Jesus Christ. It's our job to go out there and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God did send His only begotten Son, Jesus, to this planet as a man. He suffered and died a horrible death on that cross. And incidentally, you and I were the ones that were supposed to be suffering on that cross. We deserve that pain. But God sent His Son in our place to take on all that suffering. And he died on that cross. But on the third day, he arose again to live forever and ever. That, folks, is our gospel, our God, Jesus Christ. Thank you. God bless. If you'd like to get started in presuppositional apologetics, here are three resources that can help you in this area. First, we have a book called Ask Them Why, which gives you some basic background and then takes you through some examples how to do this. Even comes with a CD so you can listen to it. Also, we have another book called Christianity for Skeptics, which is an excellent book on answering many different questions that deal with presuppositional apologetics. And a third one is called The Rights Fight. Where do rights come from and how do we know? These three books you can order from our website, creationtraining.org. If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear.